what do you feel when you look at this image? Or this one? Now, I'm not going to beat around the bush. You know what a liminal space is. You've seen its images, and I'm sure you've seen dozens of these videos explaining its psychology, its definition. Perhaps you consider yourself a master of a liminal space. If that is the case, my friend, you are like me. Possessed with a strange feeling that is suddenly and violently invoked when we gaze at images such as these. The strange feelings, intoxicating, and it honestly took me forever to fully coalesce my thoughts into a singular question. What is this feeling? Many of you may say nostalgia, but I believe it goes deep in that. I believe that there is a secret story that is being expressed in each and every single one of these images, from the handcrafted to the accidental, to the real world to the digital. Each of these images convey a beautiful and tragic story, one that reflects into our own life, one that we all know, yet one we are afraid to see in its entirety. This is the beauty and tragedy of the liminal space. So I'm sure many of you know what they are, but for those who don't, a liminal space is an internet phenomenon that suddenly and violently overtook vast swaths of the internet. Seriously. There was a moment where you couldn't go more than 15 minutes without seeing this image, or perhaps even more infamously, this one. These images caused a stranglehold on our collective psyche that thousands of people ran to explain this feeling that they were experiencing, and many created pieces of media that attempted to emulate this emotion, myself included. And now, there's a whole mythos and lore regarding these so-called backrooms. A lore that has gotten so extensive that it's getting its own film produced by A24. But I digress. Liminal spaces, obviously, have existed before the internet and is actually a phenomenon that is very present in architecture and is something that is commonly discussed. The most famous of architectural liminal spaces are airport terminals, hallways, lobbies, and much, much more. These places cannot escape from the fact that they are but steps into another path, a sort of midwife between the places that we want to go and because of this, the architecture usually reflects this feeling of moving on. It's why airports feel so lifeless, despite constant bustling of people on the scale of small cities. The very design of airports want us to move to a destination. It evokes, get to where you're going. And it is strange when we reside in places such as this for too long, because we're not going anywhere, despite what the architecture is trying to convey to us. Hallways exhibit this same feeling. When we sit in a hallway, the very design of the place makes us feel like moving. And sit in a hallway of a hotel for too long and you'll feel out of place. You need to start going somewhere, even if you don't exactly know where you may be going. Architects have used many different techniques to instill these feelings into us, and honestly, all of it is done on purpose. They want us to get where we're going because, essentially, there's nothing to do in those spaces or there's something more important elsewhere. Hallways fill both of these criteria. And it's why most liminal images tend to feature hallways to nowhere. Hallways that seem like we've been there before. It's because, in a way, we have, but we didn't notice. We just walked right through it. That being said, there is far more to this phenomenon than just purposeful design. And when someone thinks of a liminal space, they think of something more akin to this. The design of this derelict department store isn't to get you through it. In fact, a lot of department stores want you to stay. But why is it when we look at this image, it evokes the same feeling as a stairwell or perhaps a hallway? Well, it appears that in recent years, the definition of what counts as a liminal space has expanded to include abandoned shopping malls, corridors, waiting rooms, amongst many others. According to Tara Ogle, director of architecture for Page and Turnbull, these are spaces that are liminal in a temporal way that occupy a space between use and disuse, past and present, transitioning from one identity to another. What Olgo is saying is simple. When we see a place that normally has dozens of people walking around, buying clothes or other odds and ends, empty, this place suddenly feels different. Very different. We no longer see this place simply. We instead see it as a place of temporality. We notice that it's no longer being used, and thus it is transformed into a liminal space. When we see an empty lot, perhaps with some rubble, we don't really feel this feeling of liminality. Nor do we feel it when we see a Toys R Us, up and running, selling toys filled to the brim with people. Suddenly, remove those people and inject a bit of disrepair and boom, we've got liminality. Ogle's statement is applicable here because it is between purposes, in between life and destruction. This place is taking a path but is frozen within this image. It is a picture of a hallway, 
even if it shows up waiting room or an empty department store. Yet, can liminal spaces exist within ourselves? Within our own lives? The answer is a resoundingly loud yes. In fact, we experience what I call liminality almost every day, from the minute all the way to the grand scale. As I stated earlier, the liminal spaces of our lives exist in much a similar way as it does in architecture. Liminality in life exists when we are in a transitional state, when we are between two events. As Melissa Cohen, a licensed clinical worker, once said, it's the space between what is and what happens next. Perhaps you're waiting on a response from your dream job or college. Perhaps you've broken up with your significant other. Perhaps you're moving. Perhaps you're on summer break. All of these moments in our lives evoke liminality. It evokes it because we're not technically making forward progress. We're waiting. The path of life has a lot of detours. We as humans always take this path by walking, not running, despite how much we tell ourselves otherwise. Because of this, all of us feel these feelings of liminality. But why? This is where we shall turn to the beautiful master thesis written by Patrick Troy Zimmerman. Written in 2008, long before the explosive popularity of liminal spaces, Zimmerman takes on the Herculean task of explaining why liminal spaces and architecture evoke such powerful emotions. Sounds similar to what we're doing today, huh? This document is a meaty one, going over 100 pages long with diagrams, pictures, and tables, all trying to explain one thing. Why are we so affected by liminal spaces? And what are they, literally? In his abstract, Zimmerman describes the alignment and lists how the liminal space is crafted literally in architecture, stating the characteristics that define liminal space include layering, dissolution, blurring, and ambiguity, and have the ability to transform the occupant of that space as they move through it. The experience of the liminal space poses a discontinuity and leads the occupant to question their surroundings, thus leading to heightened awareness of the space as a transformative threshold between distinct spaces. Zimmerman continues in describing how he intends to explain liminal spaces through the example of a ballpark and establishes many of the concepts he's going to repeat throughout the incredibly extensive thesis. And I'm not kidding, seriously, this thing is dense, but it's truly an interesting and beyond helpful read. And if you're interested in learning more about the very science of liminal spaces, I recommend giving this a read, link to it in the description. Nevertheless. To make an incredibly long story short, Zimmerman states that he uses the ballpark as an example as it is a place of ritual, where people are tested and thus reborn. He states that the design of the ballpark is very meticulously designed to transform the person from a working man, a mother, or whatever, into a baseball fan. Alongside this, learning the space of the fan and the player from the space of the city grants this place a otherworldly feel, it makes the enjoyment of the game all the better, or the ritual being conducted all the more impactful. Zimmerman quotes Fred Kowetter as he further delves deeper into the psychology of the liminal space, saying, The realm of the conscious and unconscious speculation and questioning. The zone where things concrete and ideas are intermingled, taken apart and reassembled. Where memory, values, and intentions collide. This quote describes liminal spaces as more than just a place of in-betweenness, but instead a place of amelioration or healing. A place where ideas flourish and repair themselves. A place of preparation. A safe house in a zombie apocalypse, or an apartment in a thunderstorm, perhaps. So that means that liminal spaces are actually bastions of safety in an otherwise dangerous place. I stated earlier, liminal spaces are the time periods between rituals, or perhaps between the preparation and the ritual. Rituals, of course, being the word to describe any number of things, from genuine fearing of one's life to perhaps a pure mental battle. We experience these trials every day, and if that is the case, well, <laughs> We must experience these liminal spaces as well. One such way we pass through these hidden liminal spaces is within our religion. While Zimmerman uses the example of the Athenian Acropolis, I shall use the Tory Gate. In Shinto Buddhism, the Tory Gate represents a portal of sorts between the profane, our world, and the heavenly, the other world. When we bow, we give respect to this other world before passing through it. I would argue that the Tory Gate is much akin to a hallway, and we, thus, are entering a liminal space. We are transitioning from our worldly profane problems to the problems and sanctuary of the heavenly. We are passing from a ritual to another different kind of ritual. But how does this reflect into our daily life?
Seeing liminal spaces in this light that we've given them gives them a new sense of life. It resurrects them and reveals them in a much different way than I saw them before. Instead of a place of fear, sadness, and longing, perhaps liminal spaces are a place of rest, of recuperation before some other sort of trial. Perhaps we see liminal spaces with longing because it was the last place that we were calm, that we were safe. In the hallways of a hotel, the last bastions of peace and quiet before returning to your loud siblings. That the empty department store is a reminder of the place that it was. That perhaps the airport is right before a huge move to another state. Instead of just melancholic nostalgia, it can be filled with a true sense of joy because you have seen past this melancholy and instead can appreciate what liminal spaces truly evoke. Emotions of joy, of safety. But how can we learn from liminal spaces? How can we become better people from them? Well, the answer is rather simple. We as humans are afraid of transitions. We are frightened of what is to come and long to remain in what is known because we've lived it. We know we can survive, but we are deathly afraid of this new thing because we know nothing about it yet. We must remember that we have grown from our suffering. Our trials have forced us to rid the bad and cultivate the good. We have separated, transitioned, and incorporated. The sad truth is, we can't grow without these trials, without these sufferings. Thus, we must change the way we think about these trials. We must change the way we see the suffering in our lives. Liminality is not something that is tragic, but a sign of hope. When we stand in the interstice between night and day, we are not filled with fear, but with joy. Our thoughts can swirl together and allow us to better prepare for the day. Knowing that we always have these liminal spaces can grant you strength in these trials. Knowing that you also have a place to rest after a battle is also another great boon. Alongside this, we must remember, not every liminal space leads from pain to suffering. Some will lead from suffering to joy, to freedom. Just like how night will always lead to day, we cannot let fear and pain distract us from this. The light is coming. The time between is a time to open your eyes and turn them towards the sky. This is why liminal spaces are so powerful. This is why we as humanity are so enraptured by these images. It isn't entirely because they remind us of better times, nor is it because they give off a sense of foreboding. It is because there is a chance that it will lead to growth, to rebirth. And these places can remind us of preparation, of growing strength. So, in this world of hatred, of vastly changing environments, of plague, of famine, of total and utter destruction, shall we give in to these evils or shall we cross this liminal space? Should we dare to hope or succumb to despair? I promise you, you know the answer. You've walked that floor and have crossed that threshold thousands of times before. So I ask you once more, what do you feel when you look at this image?